Ooh, that. F hell. You're censoring me now. I cannot say sh f anymore. What do you mean it's a family show? It's not a. We're gonna talk about precaution and steel balls. It's not a family show for f sake. F hell. F oh. New tablecloth. Looks fing nice. Today I'm going to talk about mice. No, not the rodent, but an acronym that originates from CIA recruitment strategy used in espionage. MICE explains the main motivators for covert and also overt action, and it stands for money, ideology, compromise and ego. Whereas CIA staff historian Randy Burkett has stated that MICE has outlived its usefulness in counterintelligence, it seems to still apply quite well to those who are recruited to spread online propaganda. This thing still works. Naturally, these motivators can also overlap. One example from counter-espionage is the case of Earl Edwin Pitts, who had been an FBI agent who sold secrets to the Soviets and later to the Russians. During his interrogation, he said that he was treated badly while working for the FBI, but was also motivated by the stacks of rubles the Russians offered. And although they told Pitts there was another $100,000 set aside for him in a bank account in Moscow, he never saw any of that. A research project called Project Slammer, conducted during the late 80s, suggested that the subjects who become spies often see themselves as special, even unique. They also often feel deserving, living in unsatisfactory situations, and often feeling like they've run out of other options. They also feel like they're not a bad person. To conclude, they are completely psychotic, catatonic, manic and delusional. Propagandists like spies often think of their work as victimless crime. Many might feel that spreading disinformation doesn't hurt anybody. It's just another version of the story. Yet these actions often have consequences. They can, for example, affect the support and aid that Ukraine gets from the West. Now, let's talk briefly about the motivators of mice. Let's start with the most obvious, which is of course... Money, money, money. If you take money out of the Russian propaganda machinery, a big chunk of it would just stop. That's why they've put a lot of effort in hiding the origin of these funds by using instruments like cryptocurrencies and offshore companies. There's evidence that some propagandists and independent journalists like the Finnish Janusz Putkonen are on the Kremlin's payroll. Another example is a Malaysian social media figure and RT columnist Ian Miles Chong, who often argues against the decadent West. Of course, money can influence businessmen and politicians too. You can become incredibly rich by doing business with the Russians, and many of them promote pro-Kremlin viewpoints out of greed. Greedy and stupid. Let's move on to ideology. Ideology can be an extremely strong motivator and often creates staunch and loyal propagandists. Most of the ideology-driven Putin propagandists come from the far corners of the left and right, but many of them also believe in various conspiracy theories and have no political affiliation. It's not rare to see people from the far left and from the far right cooperate in this domain, reinforcing the idea of the horseshoe theory. Next. Let's talk about compromise or kompromat as it's known in Russia. It refers to damaging information about a person which can then be used for blackmail purposes. The most common type of kompromat is some kind of sex tape of the person involved. Putin has used this strategy to his benefit since forever. The most famous case happened in 1999 when then FSB chief Putin released a sex tape where prosecutor General Yuri Skuratov was in bed with two young women. Skuratov had started investigating corruption of Putin's then boss, Boris Yeltsin, and this tape was used to make him resign from his position. Many young men who have visited and partied in Russia have probably become targets of kompromat. Ego is another strong motivator, 
and can create very loyal propagandists. In many cases, the propagandist's ego has been bruised and they often feel like they have been mistreated by their own country. For ego-driven propagandists, two prime examples are Scott Ritter and Douglas McGregor. Both were at some point quite talented in their work, but were to some degree mistreated by their superiors. McGregor's career was hindered due to his unorthodox methods, and Reader was humiliated as a weapons inspector. Now they're both pushing Kremlin narratives, and Reader is even touring around Russia, going to talk shows to praise Russia and defame the US and Ukraine. Tim Scott Reader Jr. Mice is good at describing our core motivations for producing and promoting propaganda, but it's also oversimplifying things. Randy Purkett has stated, that it excludes important factors like family, tribe, religion, ethnicity and nationalism. But it's still a useful tool for determining what drives these actors to publish this information, and that in most cases we can apply these motivators to most people. One of the biggest recruiters of Russian propagandists is a low-life thug and chef turned businessman Yevgeny Brigozin. In our next episode and the first edition of a new segment called The Kremlin Files, we'll introduce him in more detail. But for now, I say goodbye to you, my friends and soup lovers. We'll meet again soon on the next episode of The Soup Central.